This is Brian Robinson with a quick message to all the amazing listeners of the Real Faith Stories podcast. Thank you for listening and sharing these stories with others all around the world. I have a request. If you or someone you know has a story like the ones you've been listening to on this podcast, I'd love to hear about it. So just go to realfaithstories.com, click on the link that says Be Our Guest, and follow the instructions. I've also included the link in the show notes for this episode. Again, just go to realfaithstories.com and click on the link that says, Be Our Guest. I definitely look forward to hearing from you. Now, here's this week's episode. You are listening to the Real Faith Stories podcast, interviews with people who chose to boldly follow their faith. I'm your host, Brian Robinson. Now, let's meet our guest and hear their story. Perry, welcome to Real Faith Stories. So good to have you on the program today. I've listened to a bunch of shows, so I am honored to be on this program. You have amazing people that show up for this. Well, thank you. And that's why you're here. For those people that don't know who Perry Marshall is, I'd love for you to share a bit about yourself. And then I'm going to dive into a question regarding a story that you shared with me some time ago that really shifted things in your world. So if you would, Please go ahead and share a bit about yourself. So, pastor's kid grew up in Nebraska, uh, moved to Chicago when I was in my 20s. I am best known for books on Google and Facebook advertising and 8020. And then I also have a whole science side of my life called Evolution 2.0, which is a $10 million science prize, a book called Evolution 2.0, and some pretty significant projects in the cancer research world as well. So, and I've got a a wife and six kids, two adopted and four standard issue. (laughs) And I do a lot of consulting and speaking, and I like to invent things and, and communicate and write. So that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, that's a short one because there's so much depth to everything you just mentioned. What is it right now in your world that you feel most passionate about, Perry? Right at this moment, it is Cancer Research Foundation I started because I started to see that there were very, very interesting and effective research programs that weren't getting funded because they don't fit the standard dogmas. And, and I, I've really found a tremendous response from people on this. It started with a science conference we held about six months ago, and it's just been a fascinating ride. So I'm really liking that, despite the fact that cancer is kind of a depressing topic. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, it, it was already here before I got here. We just have an opportunity to solve some big problems. Yeah, for sure. So in your marketing world, which is what you're most well-known for, what is one of the things that you love doing most in that realm? I like reinventing old ideas and making them new. You know, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, but there are certain, certainly things that are new to any specific person. And there's an awful lot of really great ideas that made sense to, you know, a generation before or people a hundred years ago that are still applicable today, but they have to be repackaged and reinvented. And that's one of the things that I do. If you look at my work, most of my ideas aren't new. They're just new ways of looking at old things. And that's kind of a formula for me. And I love it when people have that aha moment and they're like, oh my word, I never saw that before. Now I see it everywhere. And this happens over and over again. I love it when that happens because it sets people's minds on fire. Yeah. How gratifying. So one of those repackaging experiences has been with the whole 80-20 concept, hasn't it? Yes, exactly. And about 17 years ago, 18, I think, I read Richard Koch's book, The 80-20 Principle, which I think Every business person on the planet should read that book. But I read it, and I before I read that book, I didn't realize how universal this was. I thought the 80-20 principle, which says that 
20% of your effort produces 80% of your results and vice versa. I thought that was just kind of an interesting economics or real estate thing or whatever. Richard helped me understand, no, this is everywhere. It applies to almost everything. But I was reading his book in a coffee shop and he made this oblique reference to the fact that 80-20 has something to do with fractals and chaos. And fractals are infinite repeating patterns that are, they they keep going at big and small scales, like a tree. The, The branching pattern is the whole tree, but it's also in a microscope. If you look at the leaves and the veins in the leaves, you still see that branching pattern. That's that's what fractal means. And it, it's, it's a very powerful idea that explains a lot of things. And when he said 80-20 is fractal, I was like, wait a minute. Does that mean just like a tree? Does that mean there's an 80-20 inside an 80-20 and then another one and another one and another one? And the answer was yes. And that means that that infinite repeating pattern is in your data. It's in your... It's in your checkbook, it's in your QuickBooks account, it's in your Google ad account or your Facebook account, it's in you know the product defects, it's in how productive all of your employees are, it's in the traffic patterns in your city and the size of craters on the moon. And, and I was like, wait a minute, and my, my head just like set on fire and I, I'm like, wait a minute, I jumped up and I had at this time been in business as a freelance entrepreneur for about a year and a half. And people who have been in business kind of know what a business typically looks like in a year and a half. It's kind (laughs) of coming along, you know, it's like, well, you know, maybe in another six months or a year, this will start to feel solid and stable. Mm -hmm. Right. And I ran home and I got all these papers and reports and a calculator and I'm laying on the floor. I'm going, Oh my word, this pattern this 80-20 pattern is everywhere. And I started to get this picture in my mind, like, well, this means it's not like just these two groups of things, the 80 and the 20. It actually means it's a continuum. And if you put it on a chart, it would look kind of like an exponential curve, except it's an exponential curve that goes straight up vertical on the far right side. Okay, and like seriously, it goes up to infinity. And like, this is actually the pattern that all these things everywhere in your life. So on a napkin, I kind of had the idea pretty solid, just almost like in 10 seconds. But I'm an engineer by education. And I'm like, there's a formula behind this. What is the formula? And I started looking around and I found out, well, you know, there's lots of people been talking about this for a hundred years, but they're not quite talking about it this way. Like, what's the formula? And so fast forward a month or so, I'm still obsessing about this formula. And I remember this one day, it was Friday, March 23, 2003. I'm sitting in my office and I'm like, what is that formula? I think it's a calculus formula. How do you figure it out? And I was just grinding away and I was stuck on it. And I was obsessing about it all day. Well, there was another thing I was obsessing about all day, which was three days earlier, I had, remember my, you know, youngish little marketing business, I had done a teleseminar. This is before webinars, like people just on a phone line. And I had organized a sales presentation And I had sold $11,000 in one hour, which to me at the time was like caveman discovers fire. (laughs) Oh my word. I like, uh, it used to take me three months to make that much money. Right. And, and I was thinking, wow, I wonder how I could use this to help my friend's project in Mozambique. They had a church and a school and a feeding program and an AIDS hospice and all this stuff. And my wife had been there. It was a very poor country. And I was like, wow, you know, you could really make a dent in stuff. And so I was obsessing all day long about calculus in Mozambique. And there was this music thing at church. And my wife goes, I'll watch the kids. You go to the music thing. So I go to the music thing and they're playing this Pink Floydy sort of music and I'm just standing there in La La Land and I'm thinking about math formulas and I'm thinking about Mozambique. And I look up 
And I see this woman making a beeline for me and she walks right up to me and she says, hi, my name is Vivian and the Lord gave me a word for you. And I had heard of things like this happening, but I had never had it happen to me. And I thought, well, this should be interesting. And she goes, the Lord told me that you are very, very good at math and you're working on some kind of formula, some kind of equation, some kind of invention, and you're going to figure it out. Just keep working on it. You're going to figure it out. And I looked around and I did math in my head. If there's 30 people in a church Friday night music thing, what are the chances that any of them are thinking about a math problem? And what are the chances that you picked the right guy out of the crowd and had the courage to say that to him? Like nobody's ever said anything like this to me before. Yeah. A guy she never knew. I had no idea who she was. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and she turns to walk away and then she spins back around and she goes, oh, and he told me something else too. You want to support missions and God is going to bless your business so you can support missions. I love it. Calculus, Mozambique, two in a row. She really had me with that. Mm. And I stared at her almost on the verge of tears. And all I could manage to say was, if only you knew. And she goes, he knows, points her finger in the air, and just walks away, just like that. And I stood there, and I thought about that. And I was like, did that just happen? Yeah. Dude, that just happened. That woman read you your mail. And I had not talked to anybody about this, I, not even my wife. This, this was entirely a conversation inside my own head. It sounds like you didn't have a grid for this, and then this moment just happens. Not really. That church I had been going to for maybe a year, it was a vineyard church. Vineyard is, you know, a Holy Spirit kind of place, not the kind of church I was used to. I was still trying to decide what do I think about all of this stuff. I didn't really have a strong opinion either way. And what often doesn't get said is that when new people show up in something like this, everybody else kind of has this language and this set of rules and this set of expectations. And the outsiders are like, okay, I know you guys believe all this, but I haven't seen enough of this myself to be sure. Like, oh, you know, somebody's back pain got healed. Well, I can't see anything. I don't know if it was just psychosomatic or whatever, you know, it's not like the, the amputated arm grew back or, or, you know, sometimes people would give these encouraging prophetic words, but as an outsider, you can't really like, well, okay, that sounds nice. I, I don't know that that's God. That could just be a, a burrito that you ate. And so, you know, you don't really know. And so that's kind of where I was at. I wasn't against it by any means, but I, I was a little skeptical. Yeah. And now all of a sudden this woman, like, what? And I had no idea who she was other than that her name was Vivian. But I, I happened to mention this to this other guy named Pete. And he goes, oh, yeah, I know her. You had a Vivian moment. She does that to everybody. And I'm like, oh, well, I guess she's one of those prophet type people. And but so. I haven't really finished the story because, you know, I think had this not happened, I would have been content to have my drawing on a napkin. Well, I can't really figure out the formula, but I can, you know, I can uh, sort of use it anyway and go on. But mm -hmm. she said, no, you keep working on that. And so I would work on it and get stuck and put it on the shelf and work on it and get stuck. Three years later, I finally figured it out. And 8020 has been around for a hundred years, but nobody's done it that way. And it became the backbone of my entire business, which I could go into or not, depending on wh where you want to go, Brian. But the other thing was that, you know, she'd said, God is going to bless your business so you can support missions. Now at the time, for me, this probably most significantly was a message that, so dude, it's okay to succeed. Like, take the brakes off. I mean, a lot of people have head trash about being successful. And I, gee, you know, is it really okay? Shouldn't I just be sort of an average guy with average resources and trust God and all that kind of stuff? But that was saying, no, God, God's going to bless your business. So put your foot on the accelerator. Well, about three or four months later, a book that I had just written 
on Google ads came out and literally right within about a two month window of time, Google hit the hockey stick. This is summer of 2003. And back then, most people didn't even know what Google was. Google was like the geekier internet people, like the engineers and the early adopters liked Google. Everybody else was like, you know, what's that search engine that doesn't have any bling and cell phone ads on, you right. know? Yep. But Google had introduced their advertising system, which when I started using it, I was like, this is the coolest thing I have ever seen. The entire English language is up for auction and I can put an ad in front of anybody anywhere and I only pay when they click. This is amazing. Well, this book that I had just written hit the streets and it started selling like hotcakes and basically within about two years, I was very well known all over the marketing space, especially the internet marketing space. And, you know, again, God is going to bless your business. So you can support missions. Well, yeah, we did support missions, but I remember thinking, you know, I wonder if anything interesting happened around the time that I met this Vivian person and I went looking through my mailbox and I discovered that three days before the same day I did that teleseminar, I got an email from Ken McCarthy, who at the time ran the leading internet marketing seminar. There weren't a lot of internet marketing seminars in 2002. There weren't a lot of people making money on the internet then, right? And he said, I need somebody to speak on Google at my seminar. Who should I get? And I gave him a name of somebody. And he comes back to me and he says, that guy turned me down. I think you should speak on Google ads. So come and speak at my seminar. And this is why I wrote the book, because I knew in the seminar circuit, you don't get paid to come and speak. You have to sell a product. You have to get clients and stuff. And so I wrote this book, The 80-20 Formula. It's become the backbone of my business. In fact, three years ago, it got published in Harvard Business Review. I even have a little prophetic story about that. And the Google book became the world's best-selling book on internet advertising. Incredible. Um, it's it's sold a hundred thousand copies. So we also have a Facebook book, and you know it's like, well, all these people in marketing know who Perry is. Like looking back, this woman had a word of knowledge. She overcame her inertia, and she like she didn't want to give that word to me. Like who I I've never been here. I don't know who these people are, but God's like tapping her on the shoulder, and she did, and it completely changed my life. Powerful. Let me pause here, Perry, and ask this question. You said it took three years after Vivian gave you that word that the formula, you figured it out. What was that eureka moment like for you when you figured it out, the 80-20 calculation? It's funny. I was sitting in a meeting. I was. I have a mastermind group called Roundtable, and I'm the ringleader. And you know, everybody's talking about their businesses and going back and forth. And I'm sitting there with a yellow pad of paper and I'm drawing this out. And very often, like, I almost need to be working two channels at one time. You know, I, I have all this nervous energy and lots of people, you know, they doodle, they sketch, they draw puppy dogs or whatever. Well, I'm, I'm like trying to solve this calculus formula for the 14th time. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I see how it goes together. This is easy. Why didn't I see this a long time ago? But it was like, it was the energy of that meeting. There's something, Brian, about when your best energy happens, when you are in your metron. What is a metron? A metron is your area of authority. Okay. And like, hey, I'm, I'm taking care of these people. I'm helping them run their businesses. You come to meetings because there's there's an energy in the room that you're not going to get on Zoom and you're not going to get from a, a book, right? Yeah. And and like all that energy is there and like all of a sudden problems just become easy to solve. It's like cutting through butter. And I was like, I figured it out. And then there was this one part of the math problem I didn't know how to solve. And I got on an online talent site and I hired a math guy and the next day it was solved because it was really easy to a math guy, and boom, there you go. <laughs> and I want to tell you this too. I had the formula. I put up a website. It's part of my 80-20 sales and marketing book. You can go do these calculations. But I had this feeling that I shouldn't just put the formula out there. I should wait until the right moment. And 
one day in 2013, I was journaling as I do in the morning. I call it Renaissance time. And in my journal, I asked God a question. I said, what about publishing this formula? And the answer I got was publish it in Harvard Business Review or similar. Wow. Okay. So I don't know how on earth I'm going to get into Harvard Business Review because my world of internet advertising and Harvard Business Review do not intersect, (laughs) in case anybody's wondering. I am not remotely in the academic marketing world. Well, five years later, this company called Performance Strategies in Italy wanted me to speak. They booked me to speak, and then they emailed me and said, we're featuring our speakers in Harvard Business Review Italy. Would you like to submit an article? (laughs) Now, I have a picture of this. In fact, I have a book called Memos from the Head Office, and I have a picture of the page in my journal from August 2013. Hmm. You know, it's like, and and then Harvard Business Review falls in my lap. So I wrote an article, and there's a sidebar, and there's a formula. I love it. <laughs> okay, like, what are the chances? And see, you know, I'm a I'm an analytical person, and I'm a skeptical person, like, I'm one of those Thomas kind of guys. Like, Mm -hmm. I want to see it, okay? And look, in the prophetic world, there's going to be a lot of stuff that you can't really connect to the dots. Or I don't know, how would you calculate the odds of of Harvard Business Review landing in your lap? I don't know how you calculate those odds. But here's what I can say. What I can say is when you start stacking these things up, When you start saying, what are the chances that a woman walks up to you as a perfect stranger and tries to read you your mail at all? What are the chances that she gets the math formula right? What are the chances that she gets the mission thing right? What are the chances of the Harvard Business Review thing happening? What are the chances of writing the world's best-selling book on internet advertising? At some point, you got to go, you know, You don't need all of those prophetic words to work out to know that something very, very significant is going on here. And this is not chance. This is not a coincidence. And look, there are people out there, they are going to ascribe this to chance no matter what you do or say. But I, well, again, speaking as an engineer, I think that's an abuse of statistics. And I just think that's wrong. I'm thinking back to that moment in the church in 2003. That literally changed the trajectory of your future, didn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, oh, totally. Like missing one or both of those things, I'd just be a possibly regular freelance guy working with some clients, building some websites, or what have you. See, I don't think the prophetic merely predicts the, the future. The prophetic creates the future. Explain. Well, I think. A lot of people have this idea like the path of the world is somehow foreordained and predestined in some sort of concrete. And, you know, prophetic people are just seeing into the future as to what was foreordained and predestined to happen. I don't think that's how it works. I think God created a cosmos and a humanity and a world that is full of possibilities and potentialities and affordances and options and that the the prophetic creating the future in real time as we go along. And then if we are willing to harmonize with it, then we get to be carried along by that momentum. Interesting. Uh, It's not like God has made this clockwork and that we're just part of these gears that are turning, and he's just telling us which gear to stand on. It's much more dynamic and organic than that. I think God was giving Vivian something that he wanted to give birth to, and by her cooperating and me cooperating, that birth took place, which then opens up more possibilities of more things that can happen after that. That has led fast forward now to the book you mentioned a little earlier called Memos from the Head Office, which is no coincidence. And explain a little bit about that book that's coming out in May. When my 8020 book came out, which was 10 years after I met Vivian, I had never found Vivian. I was curious, like, who was this woman? 
And I knew one guy who sort of knew who she was. He had no idea where to find her. And I went, I tracked her down and I had dinner with her and her husband. And, and I started telling them this whole story. And they're like, whoa. No kidding. Because, you know, most prophetic people don't really get the feedback loop. You know, they deposit something somewhere and life goes on and they may never find out whatever happened with that. I mean, really, the, the prophetic office is a lonely office. I went and tracked her down and we became friends. Like today, well, she was on your podcast, Vivian Hearn. So you, if people can go back and listen to that. So we, we become good friends. And shortly after that, I said, hey, I, I got an idea. I want to try a crazy experiment. I went, Vivian, I want to get you and this other prophetic woman named Erin on a webinar, a go-to webinar. I want to get 30 people on the webinar. And I want, I want to say, Brian R, go. Frank J, go. And you guys just give prophetic words to these people. You can't see them. You can't hear them. They're, you know, they're just like, they're in my panel and in the go-to webinar thing. And let's try this. And so, you know, I have this business audience and an email list and everything. So I told the Vivian story. I said, I'm going to have Vivian on a webinar and let's do this thing and let's call it memos from the head office. So sure enough, you know, 15 or 30 people show up and they start giving words. And so I'm sitting there in the chat box and people are like, whoa, like these women, this is insane. These women are reading my mail. And like really touching people in these tender places and giving them encouragement. And so it's like, well, that worked pretty well. Let's make this a monthly feature of the marketing membership. You know, for those who want to participate, you could come and do this. And it's just included in your $100 a month. And and if you don't want to do it, then no problem. You don't have to participate. So we, we started doing this and we started having every month, you know, at first it was one webinar a month, but then they we needed two and then we need three and four because all these people are like, I really like this. It, it became the most popular thing in our business membership. Why is that? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons. One reason is the entrepreneurial journey is lonely and it's painful. And whether you are living in your car trying to get a business to run or whether you just got a $400,000 tax bill and you need somebody to complain to about it, you, <laughs> you probably can't bring either situation to your church potluck. And, you know, entrepreneurs have this journey that we're on and we need, and people are desperate for encouragement. That's the truth. And affirmation and guidance and direction. Yeah. It's like, okay, what do I do? Especially these tricky business situations. There's a million situations there is no book for, there is no podcast. There is no like, well, how do I do this? And they come on these calls and they get like, well, I got a picture and you're in a baseball field and you, you know, or whatever, it, whatever it is. And they're like, oh, okay. I think I know what to do. And then they go do it. And so memos from head office has become this very familiar term. And I'm very deliberate about, I always tell people, this is not a come to Jesus meeting. In other words, nobody's going to like, try to twist your arm and get you to you know, do this kind of like be a Christian or something. Now this could be a Jesus comes to you meeting, which is an entirely different thing, but you know, that's like between you and Jesus Yeah, and people are cool with that. And so, well, after doing this now for about seven years, we have so many stories and so many interesting things that have happened to people that we decided to write a book. And so we have a book that's called memos from the head office by myself and my co-author, John Fancher. And it's probably about 20 different stories of people who have had these kind of Vivian experiences or, you know, God has spoken to them. And, and it's documented as well as I know how to document. So mm. like, there's a lot of prophetic stories where they're kind of anonymous. And like, if you believe the person that's telling you the story, then I guess you believe the story. But if, if you don't, you don't really have any way to verify it. Pretty much everybody in this book, we have their name, their website, 
This is what they do. This is their reputation. You can go find them. First names, last names, places, dates. I think this is very important because, again, there's always the skeptic that's like, I would really like to believe this, but you guys have to give me enough proof that I actually should believe it instead of just, oh, well, they're nice people. Yeah. And Because I, I think that's kind of lazy, frankly. Well, share, if you would, Perry, one story from the book. One that, that jumps out at me is uh, Shannon Stewart is a, she's a financial advisor in Michigan. And before the 2008 crash, she had dreams three nights in a row. And after the third night, she realized, okay, something vicious is going to happen to the market. I need to tell my clients to pull out of the market. And she did. And then the crash happened shortly thereafter in September of 08. In February 2020, she had a very similar set of dreams then. So she was like, oh, there's going to be another market crash. And she told her clients to pull out. It was probably about three days before the market peaked. It was right at the peak. And then the Asia version of the pandemic crash started happening. And she got an email from her compliance department saying, uh, Ms. Stewart, we see that you have told your clients to convert to cash. Why did you do this? So, you know, in these circles, you're always supposed to have a good rationale for why you did something like this. Oh, here it comes. And her, <laughs> and her answer was, God told me to pull my clients out of the market. So I did. Yeah. And they're like, well, you can't do it. Well, I did. And so there's another story of a gym merchant. He's in the gym business and he was at some trade show and he went to the bathroom without putting away his gems, which you never, ever, ever, ever do. GEM, a gem merchant. Gotcha. Yeah. Gem, like diamonds and rubies and emeralds. And when he came back, somebody had stolen all his gems, which wiped out his inventory. and. And like, this was a devastating blow. Not only this, he was actually a gem merchant guru, right? Like, this is how you run a gem business. And, you know, he was just down in the dumps and he couldn't figure out what to do. And he's a Jewish guy. And his wife was like, well, well why don't you pray? And he looks at her like she's from Mars. Like, how would that help anything? But he did. And then within maybe the next week, he got three phone calls. And every single one of them was, in fact, one of them, I think, happened like within minutes after he prayed. It's like, I am looking for X, Y, Z. And he was like, well, that happens to be exactly one of the things that I still have that didn't get stolen. <laughs> you know. And then, and, and this happened three times in a row in a very short period of time. And it was like three phone calls, three little bits of inventory generates cash flow and got him moving again. And so there's a lot of stories like this. They're not all happy, happy, joy, joy stories. There's a guy named Chauncey Hutter that he got a prophetic word. Hey man, like uh, some hard times are coming. And, and he went through 10 years of a rough patch. But, you know, as you would know, Brian, the important thing about the rough patch is that God is still there. And then he got a prophetic word later, like, okay, it's coming to an end. And you're going to come out of this. And it, and it did. And so I think most people have not, well, this is why you have this podcast. Most people have not heard enough of these stories to know how to live in the prophetic flow and to know that they can rely on it. And this is why you do what you do. And this is why I wrote this book. I also wrote the book for people who are not necessarily Christians. It is not laden with Christianese or Christian language or Christian assumptions because my experience is God can talk to anybody, Jewish, agnostic, Hindu, Buddhist, Catholic, Protestant, anything. Well, on that note, Perry, I'd love to finish up by having you please pray for our listeners. But before you do, how can people find out more about you? If you go to perrymarshall.com, I would suggest go to perrymarshall.com, scroll down and click on the 30-day Street MBA email series and just sign up and I'll, I'll start challenging your assumptions 
from the very first day. And you can get memos from the head office on Amazon and uh, anywhere Amazon ships books. So those would be two good ways. Okay, perfect. So if you would, please pray for our listeners as we finish up here. So I ask the spirit of wisdom to come and be everyone who's listening today. And I pray that you would open ears, that you would unsmear blind eyes, that you would shift the atmosphere around us so that we will attract memos from the head office, that whoever, wherever they need to come from, it could be a garage mechanic, it could be a pastor, it could be a physicist, whoever needs to drop a piece of wisdom on you, that that the, the atmosphere will be open so that they can do that and so that you can hear. And I also bless the prophetic ear of people who are listening that you have knowledge or wisdom to share, that you would have the boldness to share, and that the listener would be receptive in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Perry. I could talk for hours and think it might be fun to have you back again. <laughs> I appreciate uh, it. That would be terrific. I would love it. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. Please make sure you subscribe to the show and share this with someone you believe would be encouraged and motivated by these stories. Until next time, I'm Brian Robinson reminding you that the greatest decision you could ever make is to ask Jesus Christ to become the Lord of your life. If you haven't done that, read Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. Thanks again for listening.